As soon as videotape left the factory, it already started to break down. Information that is on the tapes is slowly dying, and if we don't preserve them, important historical content that's contained on them will be lost forever. What is MEPOPS? What is MEPOPS? What is MEPOPS? MEPOPS stands for Moving Image Preservation of Puget Sound. What MEPOPS does for the general public of the Pacific Northwest is provide access to digitized content. Our mission is to raise awareness about the magnetic media crisis, the alarm that the Association of Moving Image Archivists sounded to sort of bring awareness to the urgency of digitizing videotape. Audiovisual Archive in Australia has put a deadline of 2025 to say if you don't have your magnetic material digitized by this time, you're, you're screwed. They're figuring out the actual date and it's right around the corner. Within 20 to 30 years of the time it's created, it's, it's disintegrating. The magnetic media crisis is sometimes called a gathering storm because the deterioration of the actual analog videotapes and then the increasing obsolescence and rarity of the players that play them back. So video is a little bit different from film in that video went through all these different iterations, all these different formats for consumer purposes, for broadcast purposes, whereas film, there were consumer formats, 616 millimeter, 8, 8 millimeter, but the principle of film has stayed pretty consistent and video requires all these different players. A lot of the formats that we work with stopped being manufactured years ago. And so we have to make sure that we take good care of them and tune them up, clean them, because a lot of the parts and players are getting harder and harder to come by, and so are the people who actually work on them. They're a dying breed, if you will. In some cases, people thought they were creating preservation copies by putting um, film onto videotape. In fact, that was that was not a great a great a great idea. Film is actually quite stable. The thing about older media types like film and negatives is that they are stable. Thirty years from now, you're going to be able to view them. Hundred-year-old nitrate film, in some cases, is still around and looks gorgeous. Rosa Video, for its manufacture, had a completely different different purpose. It was more of a kind of uh, democratizing um, format for shooting. It was a lot cheaper than film, so not only were professionals using it, but also amateurs and just the average person was able to buy videotape and record. There was plenty of access. You could watch your, your VHS tape of a film, but now that VHS tape needs a lot of help. We have to keep up. We can't just sort of settle back and say, okay, we're finished. Despite the fact that we're working with old materials that have their fixed content, the way we view that material, the way we store that material is going to just keep changing and evolving. A lot of the time, videotape is capturing real people doing real things. That might sound personal and boring, but it really encompasses so much of Seattle and Seattle's history that it's valuable to the general public and great for them to be able to access it. The public is able to see files digitized at MePops on Internet Archive where we create collections for each group so that they can, based on that institution, go in and view the content on their personal computer. Visual Archivist for Moving Image Preservation at Puget Sound, or MEPOPS. This past month, MEPOPS has dedicated all virtual moving history screenings to highlighting the voices of Seattle's Black community. We believe that to better understand the anger and urgency surrounding the current protests, as well as the depth and complexity of systemic racism in Seattle, it is important to examine historical context, including the evolution of local conversations regarding race. These screenings have been a preview into some of the historical resources available from local archives that document these conversations. Each program honors the contributions of Seattle's Black community to art, activism, poetry, literature, music, theater, and government. One of the many reasons we at MePops are passionate about magnetic media, which is videotape versus film, is that its affordability and ease of use provided a democratizing opportunity for recording. The commercial availability and technological accessibility of videotape greatly diversified the content that could be created and saved by heritage journalism and arts communities. The Pacific Northwest's moving image history must reflect that diversity of perspectives and stories. 
We must continue to prioritize BIPOC made and century materials and support public access to that content. Marginalized communities are essential voices in our cultural heritage. To become better archivists and allies, we are committed to seeking and creating ways to amplify them. Earlier this month, I had the pleasure of interviewing Elmer Dixon, co-founder of the Seattle chapter of the Black Panthers. The following are excerpts from that conversation. To view the full interview, please visit mepops.org. Thank you, and I hope that you enjoy this installment of Virtual Moving History. I think um, it's it's important to let them have their voice. Uh, it's an interesting question as I was on a call with a, a close friend of mine who works <clears throat> with uh, uh, black and other students of color in the uh, Bellevue School District. And um, uh, the superintendent uh, had just uh, or is issuing today his um, uh, response to police and the Bellevue uh, schools, the high schools, I guess the Bellevue School District, and he's going to keep them and the students want them out of the schools. And um, the woman that I was speaking to was saying that, you know, she wanted to, to, to give them direction about why they, sh they may want to compromise. And I reminded her that um, you know, kids, you know, they don't want to compromise. You know, I was 17 when um, my, my cohorts and I started the first high school black student union on the West Coast and we disrupted the school and um, didn't stand for the Pledge of Allegiance and I got kicked out of school because I was in the stage band and I was on the floor and I was visible. Um, and I, re you know, long before Callum Kaepernick took a knee. Um, and um, and we did several other disruptions uh, before the principal finally gave in and, and, and gave us our BSU. Um, we had to go over to Franklin High School to help them get their BSU. And we were, we actually ended up taking over the principal's office. Um, and had we been listening to an adult advisor saying, don't do that, we probably would have told them to uh, go, go shove it because we were going to do it the way we wanted to do it. So I think empowering students is listening to them, not directing them, not telling them how to do it, but listening to them and let them use their own voice and their own ideas. And if we don't like it, if, if, we're, if we think it's too radical, just remember when we were 17. Remember when we were 16 and 17 and 18 years old, uh, we weren't going to listen to a 40 year old tell us how to launch our movement. So empowering them means giving them the voice, allowing them to, um, identify their own goals and their own strategies. We can advise, but uh, they're gonna do it their way. And we just wanna make sure that, you know, that I think as, a, as advisors to them, you know, try to keep them as safe as possible, but also recognize that, that it's, it's their turn, it's their time uh, to, to speak up, to speak out, to, to be activists and encourage it. When the Gen Xers um, uh, became adults, um, part of their generation was complacency because they had seen their parents or grandparents, you know, fight a revolution as, as I was doing. And, and while we made accomplishments, we didn't win. I know some might argue that there were some things that we did win. You know, the fact that uh, our free breakfast program embarrassed the federal government into providing free breakfast and free lunch for kids, we were murdered and attacked because we fed kids breakfast. Um, uh, and 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 I remember when 
the uh, I was approached by um, a team from an individual from the um, from the Senate investigating hearings, um, and I didn't know at the time that he was representing the um, the House on American Activities Committee, which I eventually ended up being subpoenaed to testify before, and I took the Fifth Amendment 17 times, much to their dismay. And but when he asked me, so why are you feeding kids? I said, you know, come on, duh, kids are hungry. 30 years later, I remember hearing the Secretary of Education or whoever, whatever secretary it was for the federal government get asked that exact same question. And she said, kids can't, kids are hungry. They can't afford to eat. Uh, their parents can't afford to feed them. You know, my response 30 years later and other Panthers around the country, I'm sure, who were, were challenged at that time. So we embarrass the federal government into providing kids breakfast and lunch. And a lot of people don't know that. So there's some things that we, we did, but I think overall, we know that the system did not change. That's why we're back in the streets, you know, here 50 years later. I speak at schools and universities across the, the globe. I guest lecture at a university in Finland every year on, on diversity and multicultural issues for the last 10 years. And whenever I go into the classrooms, before I can get anything out about intercultural, multicultural, diversity, inclusion, they all want to hear the story, my story of the Black Panther Party first. Um, and, and in fact, the last few years, I've been invited out to finish high schools, where I've talked to auditoriums full of Finnish kids. And after the, my speech, I always get a few kids that come up to me and ask, how do we start a Black Panther Party in Finland? It, it, there's a, you know, there's a global um, change in the air in terms of these young folks are not, they're not standing for it. You know, they, they, they're, they're exposed to so much more information through cell phones and the internet, things that, that we didn't have in our generation. And so um, they're, they are, they're mad. They have a right to be mad, and um, uh, they're they're pushing for change. But I was asked to speak at an elementary school in Bellevue, predominantly white school, and I was asked to speak to second graders. There's a, a movement afoot of young people who are aware much earlier, who haven't been exposed to the uh, to the lies about not only us but about history to the extent that they. They, they, you know, they're, they're confused. They're not confused. And so um, what you're seeing now is, I believe, is just the, the tip of the iceberg. I think that as more of these young people become aware, they're going to stand up and they're going to fight for justice. They're going to fight for freedom. They're going to fight for what's right. Anyway, it's, uh, it's encouraging. Well, I told them, you don't need to start a Black Panther Party. You need to start something that's new, that's, that's unique to who you are and your, what your movement is. And you certainly can, I told them, you certainly can learn from the lessons of the Black Panther Party. You know, the, the, the number one lesson is, is making sure that you know what you're fighting for. We were always uh, clear about, you know, how we were going about our struggle because we had our 10 point program and the 10 point program guided our way and in fact, Everything that we did, all of the programs that we started, grew out of the 10-point program. You know, we wanted an immediate end to police brutality and murder of Black people, point number seven, uh, which, which spawned the police alert patrols. Um, and so understanding that you have to have a platform and a program, you need to know what you're about so that you can go out and, and, and you know, attack the problem or attack the issue. Uh, and, and that's the encouraging thing about this current wave of, of uprising. And even the Black Lives Matter, the Black Lives Matter movement early on had no platform or structure. Um, but this year, they came with a, a, a list of set demands um, and they articulated them well. And so that has been uh, a, a change, an encouraging change, uh, is that there, there needs to be some sort of structure to what it is you're doing. And the Black Panther Party had uh, a very tight structure. We were a, 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 a tight-knit 
structured organization. Um, the only thing that we weren't prepared for was the level of attack that would come at us from the FBI through informants and agent provocateurs, which eventually led to the, um, the demise of the party because so many deaths, uh, so many imprisonments because people we were being set up all the time were murdered. Um, and J. Edgar Hoover, you know, he let us know they were coming because he named us the number one threat to the internal security of the United States in the summer of 1968, the summer that we started the first chapter of the Black Panther Party outside of California here in Seattle. Um, so we, we, we got prepared quickly for the attacks, but not to the level that um, the FBI engaged their counterterrorism terrorism warfare against the Black Panther Party. The demonstrators um, who were marching and protesting daily, you know, sent a message to America that, you know, change has got to happen. Um, America got the message that we're watching and you got to do things differently because, you know, people were impacted, you know, not by just the demonstrations, but they were impacted by the George Floyd video themselves, you know, a public lynching on TV of a black man. And, and it, it resonated because people saw him being choked to death in their living rooms. And it resonated with people. This is America. You know, we're supposed to be the, 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 the land of the free and the home of the brave. We're supposed to stand up against injustice. And here you're having uh, apartheid in the United States in 2020. And I emphasize to people that these murders are not new. They have been going on throughout our history. Um, it, it's a, it, these are historical, you know, every decade, every year, there's murders of innocent black people. And, and some people like to then, you know, turn and say, well, what about all the murders within your own community that are being committed by uh, black gang members against, you know, each other? You know, 500 shootings a year in Chicago and one weekend, 52 deaths. Well, that was all set in motion by the CIA and the and the the powers that be in this country. They armed the gangs, they they poured drugs into the community. That was all set in motion by the system, you know. And so they're the ones to blame for it. They're the ones whose the 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 blood of those those 500, 600 kids that die each year because of gang violence within our communities. The blood is on the hands of this government. Um, and people don't know that enough, but the story will get out there. J. Edgar Hoover had ordered his field offices to disrupt, destroy, and discredit what he called black hate groups. And he was targeting the Black Panther Party and he said, prevent the rise of a black messiah. So my passion, you know, before and during as a Panther and after is what, what, what inspires me to continue to do this work. It's actually been a, a benefit because people know the depth of the, my commitment, uh, the fact that I was a revolutionary at 17 years old, along with my comrades. So they see that as a strength and a benefit to the work that we're doing today. Most people never knew that about me, but today it's front and center. And, and the truth about the Black Panther Party is finally being told. Number one, I think, is, is to make sure that you have a solid foundation. You know, know what you're, what you're demanding um, and, and stick to them um, and be resolute. Uh, don't give up. Um, keep pushing forward. Um, and it's important not to try to change the world, but to pick your battle or battles and focus on those things um, because there will come a time when you feel like you're burned out or you're not making any headway and you, you probably have, have, have pushed your, your, your agenda too, too wide. But focus on the things that, that are most important. And I think in terms of 
um, what the Seattle movement and other movements can continue to do, because I think they're already on this track. They don't need me to tell them. And that is, is that police reform and prison reform are, are, are critical and most important. Um, you know, there's, a, there's been talk about defunding the police, but if you're gonna defund the police, you have to have something in place to, to, to account for that and replace it. One of the things that we did as Black Panthers, we had a community control of police program that we were pushing. And in that community control of police, we were calling for an overhaul of the department, departments like they're doing today, and a reinstituting of community policing, um, retraining um, in terms of peace being a peace officer because cops have always been seen as an invading force in our community from the days of slavery when they were slave catchers. Um, and so the, the distrust you know, runs rampant. And so they have to, uh, it's not even a matter of rebuilding trust because they've never had it. It's a matter of building trust from ground zero. of 1719 and 21 East Yesler Way. I bought a building in 1956 at that location. I have paid for the building. I own two apartments upstairs, two stores downstairs. One, my beauty shop is located in it. And I've been a beautician for 20 years in the state. And I also rent the other to the Third Order of St. Francis. I had Mr. John S. Chen to visit my building. In 1965, 
he brought along two men with him. They went through my building and opened the doors to them from top to bottom. Then, in 1967, I received this letter that my building had been inspected and they made out an analysis which was signed by Mr. Russell H. Dawson and the, uh, the structure inspection. They sent it for Block 10 on yesterday and I, my building is on Block 18. And from what they put on it was foundation, beams, plumbing, floors, wall coverings, coverings and guts. Now, when they came into this building, I have a permit from the building department right in the beauty shop. In the utility room in plain, in plain view, I have every permit that uh, I got from the, the permit department for plumbing, sewer, even for my beauty shop permits there. Now, if the place is so dilapidated and run down according to the map, where my place is completely wiped out, why did I get the permits from the building departments? I have every, per I have the building department right here with me. Now, why would they send me a permit and where well, I can rent the building and it's so bad? And our, every year we have beauty uh, inspector comes by to my shop. Last, uh, two Saturdays ago, the fire department inspector came into the building and talked with me. He went all through the building at the bottom, up to the stairways, into the apartment hall, came back and told me, Mrs. Collins, you don't have anything to worry about. This is not a fire hazard. The only thing I want you to get is a fire distinguisher, which I am purchasing. So now I will ask you, gentlemen, why do I have to give up my place just because Urban Renewal wants to come in and just wipe me completely off the map? I have no place to go now. But right on the corner, there is a high apartment building. So I'm asking you to take it under consideration. Thank you. His block, her block, their block. Blocks make a neighborhood, and neighborhoods can be shared. Fact is, today, anyone can live on anyone's block. So if you're looking for a place to live, remember, you can live any place. Fair housing means that any block is your block, and it's your move. For help on a housing discrimination problem, call 800-424-9524. 800-424-9524. Redlining. It's a vicious circle. It's when banks and other lending institutions decide a neighborhood is depressed because of racial makeup, ages, or income of the residents. When loans are not made for upkeep, improvements, and new building, the neighborhood collapses. Soon, neighboring areas are affected. The vicious circle of redlining has to be broken. For more information, call 213-474-7342.
The diary of 1969 is filled with the tragedy and the joy of the human experience. And like all human experience, it came day by day to be lived without excuse or rationale. For the Seattle Urban League, it is a year marked in its infancy by hate and assassination. In Seattle, January already had a sense of the unreal as an icy winter snow gripped the spirit and seemed to chill the very soul. For Ed Pratt, reality ended abruptly with a snowball thrown at his porch. The assassin crouched in the carport in the classic fear of the nameless killer. A shocked city was left to examine why and to wonder its own heart in a search for a seed of hatred which had grown out of all proportion, like a cancer. Urban League National Executive Director Whitney Young voiced that concern. Uh, we mourn with a great deal of anger that uh, this could occur uh, anywhere in America, and particularly in, in Seattle, a city that um, I visited on many occasions, and without exception have been reminded of what a wonderful city it was and uh, a city that I'm sure most of the people felt uh, that this type of thing couldn't happen here. I uh, don't believe in collective guilt, uh, but I do uh, know that uh, when these type of things happen, that you have to stop and think that whoever did it was raised in this environment and was one who uh, who got his attitudes from this community. And so this community bears the responsibility of having spawned anybody who would, um, who would commit a crime like this. Ed Pratt's death seemed to place a period, ending a special chapter of Seattle history. A troubled chapter with yet unresolved questions awaiting the author's mood to continue. The Urban League was beset by both tragic loss and the expected anguish over a change in leadership. Through the early months, the work went on, though an introspective anticipation of what was to take place. In February, the Kramer Report, dedicated to Edwin Pratt, was released. It was a state survey of the causes and prevention of civil disorder. It gave official stature to the pleas for participation that had echoed down empty legislative halls and city offices for years. The report was a broad and comprehensive examination of the state's social fabric, but from its first page, it invited a lengthy stream of involvement from the public to avoid becoming a companion piece to the now dusty reports and investigations of the past. With that as a prelude, the Urban League faced up to spring. With March came a major attempt to invest the central area schools with an unaccustomed sense of dignity and personal concern. The Urban League moved literally to a door-to-door -door operation while supplying staff for the ad hoc election committee. This in support of the election which would choose a central area school council. The council offered a first time participation at neighborhood level in the affairs of learning. With the change of the system, many inbred and seemingly impossible obstacles returned to soluble dimensions. Power returned to the community. 20 year olds could hold elective office. 18 year olds entered the voting booths for the first time. Ballot power. Sixteen council members began the heady task of cementing the cracks in the educational mirror and in the process brightening the image of the community. The first action, naming Dr. Patterson superintendent of the central area schools. A movement which is taking place throughout the nation, an attempt to make ed education relevant to uh, the communities that are being served. And the only way to do this is to get the decision making as close to the community as possible. I do think it has national importance. In May, the League moved to solidify its own structure. Jerome Page was named as executive director to guide the organization and to carry the growing load of League involvement. The timing seemed extraordinary. Only days later, the young people of the city flexed their muscles and found them ready for a challenge. Seattle Community College proved a likely task. The city's first serious taste of confrontation politics had begun. The now accustomed sight of young faces staring back at the helmeted blue denim lines of Seattle police filled newspapers and television screens for a full week. The mantle of leadership on both sides swayed from shoulder to shoulder. It was quickly discovered that leaders who a week before had sat down across conference tables with an assumed line of communication to the core city were talking to the wrong people. New lines had to be forged 
even a new language and symbolism was tied to the street level politic. League director Jerome Page tried to explain how the communication goes awry between school and students. She has been telling them very strongly in the last week or so what they can do to relate better to the black community. But the community college insists upon inviting black leaders down to a luncheon to ask what we can do to better relate to the black community. And the ironical thing about it, A. Franklin Williams was uh, uh, elected by the community to be on the school council. So I feel that if he isn't uh, a part of what's being said in the community, then none of us are. Streets, however, are a good deal more than avenues of protest and squad cars. Behind the empty porches and silent windows, people waited for an ebb in the flood of action. Less visible in the torrent of protest, the league staff at Operation Equality was laboring with the black-white checkerboard of Seattle neighborhoods. In the same month of May, Seattle King County Real Estate Board joined the Seattle Black Realtors Group to renovate a Queen Anne Hill home. Operation Equality, working from its own renovated office on Empire Way, produced a background of expertise and experience to complement new homeowners, many of whom had never experienced the life of a mortgagee with its attendant problems of securing a home loan and even fixing a leaky faucet. Low-income homeownership received wider community attention in the following months. In August, the Puget Sound Governmental Conference announced it was applying for an Operation Breakthrough Grant, with the League instrumental in developing the initial proposals. In September, Governor Evans declared that new housing had to have an immediate priority in state programs. As Operation Equality functioned, a parallel accomplishment was seen in the community realization that housing could be found, or created, made to work. New faces were seen in the thrust toward home ownership, new plans, new initiative, incentive, through workshops, financial advice, encouragement, Operation Equality clients were led step by step, matching people with places. With fall, a new and potent force for change emerged. Led by the Central Contractors Association, the call for minority employment in construction reached audible proportions even at the lofty levels of construction site and government office. In short order, government contract construction eased to a halt in the city. The courthouse annex, Harborview Hospital, and the dramatic confrontation at the University of Washington. With police tactical units deployed around the site, the demonstrators moved aggressively to make their point against equipment and job. Faced with a new community conflict, the Urban League assigned a full-time staff member to assist the black contractors in presenting their positions. The League role became one of aiding the parties involved in identifying and organizing the problem-solving techniques available in the larger community. Now look at the history of where the labor movement came from, how it started. Look at Seattle's history and the blood that was in the streets uh, just a few years ago in the beginning of the labor movement here. And, and then ask yourselves, what about a bloody nose yesterday? I think the contractors were simply asking for some cooperation. The demonstrations and confrontation led to talks at the county level. For a period of time, it appeared that a plan agreeable to all parties could be negotiated. After a disappointing lapse of discussion, the Central Area Contractors Association moved their attention to the mammoth construction work underway at Seattle-Tacoma Airport. There, in the first week of November, both work in the giant pit in front of the terminal and the more critical action on the flight line stopped. Tyree Scott, head of the contractors, was a brand new voice. Well, we've got the mechanics started to close the, the jobs down, but and we'll be out here as soon as we get done. We're, well, we're trying to keep them, got to prevent this in that room a while ago. We're trying to prevent this, sir. 
No, but I don't understand what this has to do with shutting the job. Well, I, what I was saying was, you said it wasn't your problem. I said, it's, it's everybody in this country's problem. We're trying to prevent anything from happening right now. No, I didn't say But the point is... Tell the contractors to go home. You can go tell them. Go tell them well, to go home. Again, the Urban League continued in its attempt to serve the black community by working with committed groups and individuals to bring about solutions, positive social change. Through supportive solutions sought by many, the League hopes to avoid impressing its own thinking on either separate organizations or individual attempts at improving the social fabric of the community. The League reaches for positive results from whatever origin, offering compatible services to parallel the desires of those caught in the struggle for improvement. The Urban League moved on a thoroughly broadly based program of participation, on-the-job training for both initial entrance to the workforce and upgrading of skills, writing employee contracts. The League worked with social and welfare agencies to improve delivery and quality of services for the black and poor, encouraging the use of service recipients as active policy makers and implementers in the agencies. Operation Higher Motivation, started by the League, was adopted by the Municipal League for establishing career seminars for ninth graders. The Urban League continued its development of law and justice concepts for the minority community, involving police community relations and the use of the law as a method of affecting personal change in the structure of society. The work of the Urban League, like the force of life it supports, goes on in, as yet, an undefined circle of recurring events. Thus, 1969 became an extension of 1968, an introduction to 1970, imprinted with the drama of life which can most easily be defined as people. Have you seen some bits and pieces of Seattle and it's Urban League in the past few minutes. We've got things like join hands, community councils, church groups who are saying we're not giving up in spite of what various leaders around our nation say. We're not giving up and our priority right now is the urban crisis and the central cities and human relations and seeing that people get to know people and people get along. I think it's up to you and up to everyone out there to do his bit, join the Urban League, get involved in the NAACP, find out what Join Hands is, are doing, various organizations around our city and around our community. The, the action is here in the central area, but you don't have to be here to be a part of the action. University of Washington. And, yes. Uh, this was I, I was studying uh, uh, economics, uh, graduate studies in economics and political science. As you were studying there at Seattle University, University of Washington, what, what were your career plans for the hopes? Well, uh, I started out from when I left Louisiana, I wanted to get into public service and I wanted to be a public official. What inspired that interest? Uh, listening to the radio back down in Louisiana, listening to the convention, Democratic and Republican conventions down there. And there was a lot of hullabaloo, and I just imagined myself being a part of that. I caught that dream, and I kept it all the way through the Army, all the way through college. And I was always preparing just for that. So you, you were fixed, fixed on politics at an early age? At a very early Public age, service. when I was still a teenager. While you were at Seattle University or uh, at the University of Washington, did you have an opportunity Involved in politics locally? Well, I didn't get involved in politics uh, at that time. The only time I got in politics was when I was just about to finish uh, at CLU. Then the time came to get involved in a political campaign in which Pomeroy was coming up to try to be mayor. I got involved in that. That gave me my first taste of the raw politics. 
That was Alan Pomeroy. Alan Pomeroy, mm -hmm. 19, the, the, the winter of 1951-52. And I found that I could rally the people because in the areas where he, they had been having 18 and 19 people vote in general or special election, I doubled and tripled that. And so that's how I found out that I had the ability to make him come out. You were in the legislature through the early part of the 1960s during much of the unrest yes. in the state of Washington. I was, in, I was in the legislature starting in 1958 when unrest was already in the southern states. And, and I was there when it came on up and engulfed uh, the Northwest. And, and uh, it was probably the most uneasy time I spent because I recognized that a social revolution was going on and I didn't know how to handle it. So I went from, um, shall we say, uh, 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 door to door, meeting to meeting, trying to figure out what was the best way to handle it, to survive the change, to be a part of the change, and not to get caught, up, caught out on either extreme. And I managed to do it accidentally. There were many sources of that uh discontent in the 60s, as we both know, there was the civil rights issues, there were the issues over the Vietnam War, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, youth and education, and, and many others. Uh, let's talk about uh, let's talk about the civil rights uh, movement. I was deeply involved in the civil yes, rights. I know you were. But uh, could you give us some, perhaps a little summary of some of the aspects of the civil rights movement that you were most personally involved in? Well, uh, first thing, the, uh, the civil rights movement reached and brought out a group of people that had not been involved in civic activities before. It had got people who uh, you would never hardly meet in your ordinary life, but they all came together in one movement demanding equal rights, demanding equal opportunity. It was a period when uh, I was caught between two opinions in that I wanted to aid and assist the civil rights movement but the, the, uh, but the people who were involved in it, some of them, particularly a bunch, a bunch of the young people, did not trust me because they looked upon me as part of the uh, old establishment. Because since I was an office holder. Office. Yes, uh, and so uh, I, I was caught trying to be friend to a group that was unfriendly, and yet I uh, didn't want to be against them. And it was violent because some people were getting killed, some people were getting hurt. And so I had to find the middle ground. So I was uncomfortable, but I found it. And I had to force myself on many of the people, but I did, to make sure that they knew that I was part of the movement for progress. In the 1950s and 1960s, who, who were some of the key leaders on one side or the other in the civil rights movement in this area? In this particular area, you had Larry Gossett, you had uh, uh, Eddie Rye, Fred Garrett, who right. now known called Omar Tari. <laughs> and uh, uh, you had uh, 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 and uh, Infanta Spence and a number of others that, that, that have long since sort of left the area. But they were deeply involved in it and they were sort of in a reckless abandon. Curtis Harris was the member of the Black Panthers, Panthers and there was Aaron Dixon who was head of the Black Panthers. All of those were involved in an aspect. And what I had to do was to make myself acceptable to all of them in some way or another. And they wanted to take charge of me, but I couldn't allow that, yet I had to appear friendly. They would walk in a chalk line, but I did. What role uh, did the Urban League play in the civil rights movement? During the time that Ed Pratt was uh, here, the Urban League played a big role. After Ed Pratt's death, untimely death, uh, the Urban he was, League- He was murdered, was he not? Yes, yes. He didn't. He did not play. Uh, the Urban League did not play such a big role after that. NAACP became more vocal. Who were the key people with the NAACP in oh, this area? We still got the same one: the Lacey Steele, Joe, Charles Johnson, and a few others. And Dak Tanner. They all were the biggies in the Dak Tanner is now federal judge, federal judge. judge and, and Judge Johnson is, is now a Superior Court judge. Of course, Lacey Steele is. Uh, still doing it at Boeing as a supervisor. Uh, what about the involvement of churches and church leaders in the civil rights movement oh, in this uh, area? In that regard, Mount Zion Baptist Church and the First AME Church, uh, John Adams, uh, First AME, and Sam McKinney of the Mount Zion Baptist Church were the big ring leaders 
and they had others following along behind them, like Norman Mitchell and a few, and Mance Jackson and a few others. But uh, the, the most effective leaders were John Adams, he's now a bishop in Washington, D.C., and Reverend Sam McKinney, who's still pastor of the Mount Zion Baptist Church for the past 30 years. I understand Mr. Hill's language, but perhaps Mr. Hill has not lived in the central community, made a call for police, and waited 45 minutes to get a response. By the same token, perhaps Mr. Hill has not lived in the community where that community was inflamed at the police department, and you had to literally throw yourself in between them to try to get them on speaking terms. We have an atmosphere now whereby there's a congeniality in wanting a precinct out in our neighborhood somewhere, and we're not going to fuss and argue about where it's located. The idea is to increase service. The people in the central community pay the tax that support the north and the south precinct, and uh, I think that they are quite willing to pay the tax to support that third precinct because the whole structure of government is moving towards neighborhood operations. Just this morning, I participated in the opening of an unemployment security office in Ballard so that the people in that general northwest neighborhood where Mr. Hill lives would not have to come downtown to Till Avenue North, but they could go out in that neighborhood and get services. So the people of the central community have long been denied, often promised, and it's time for delivery. So I strongly urge you to support Mr. Ravel's position for the three precincts. Basically, what this is going to be is a, a, a question and answer type exchange. So, uh, in introducing Brother Walter, I want all of if, I can, if everybody can uh, settle down for a minute. In introducing Walter, I like to see if we can work it out so that we can entertain as many questions as possible and try and make some of the questions short ones or ones that would have brief answers. Brother Walter Collins is a native of New Orleans, and his family history goes back a very long way. Uh, 
I'll just go back a brief way. It's his mother is the Southern Regional Vice President of the Republic of New Africa. Walter himself has been involved in a number of activities uh, since time knows when. Uh, he was a member of SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. He was a member of NAF, National Association of Black Students. He's a member of, he's an executive director now of the Southern Conference Educational Fund. He's been in a number of other organizations and the list would be too long for me to go through them all. So I'd just like to open it up and give you Brother Walter Collins and Sister Angela Davis. I don't really have any formal statement to make, but I'd like to give, you know, just a brief history in terms of why I'm here. I mean, I've known Lynn uh, in New Orleans and worked very closely with him at the, at the SNCC chapter there. In terms of my own activities, I uh, was very active in forming a national organization to begin to deal with the uh, ripoff of young black men on selective service, particularly as the buildup in Vietnam took place in the mid-60s and culminating in the real massacre of uh, brothers and sisters about, um, brothers in about 1968. Uh, and for my activities, I spent 26 months in the federal prison in Texarkana, Texas, having been sentenced on five counts of failing to report or submit to induction. I was sentenced to five years on each count and five fined $2,000. I spent 26 months, as I said, in Texarkana and have been pretty active inside of Texarkana and other prisons uh, working to free brothers that I met in prisons or cases I heard about where it was clear that they're in prison because it didn't have proper legal representation or because of the racist hysteria that pervades this country. And am now involved uh, in the South in those campaigns and sit on a steering committee of the National Alliance Against Racism and Political Repression of which Angela is a vice uh, chairperson. And that's you know, all I have to say. Any particular questions that you want to ask either of us, I think we should proceed in that manner, unless Angela has something form she wants to say. Well, perhaps I could say simply that I am here in connection with the efforts of the National Alliance Against Racist and Political Repression. Uh, I am the one of the co-chairpersons of that organization which was founded, formally founded, in May of this year. And I'm here because I feel that we all have a very deep responsibility to all of our sisters and brothers, all of the thousands, the tens of thousands of sisters and brothers who are in jails and prisons all over this country. Um, the experiences which I had in um, jails in New York and Marin County and Santa Clara, Santa Clara County were, I'm very sure, very similar to the experiences which Brother Walter Collins had uh, during his imprisonment. And I'm sure there are very few of you in this room today who don't have a relative, a friend, somebody you know who's had to, or some of you probably had to come to grips with these people yourself, who hasn't had some kind of experience with the uh, racism and the repressive character of police, courts, and the prison system in this country today. And if we understand the need to struggle <coughs> for black liberation, Chicano liberation, Indian liberation, Asian liberation, then we have to understand that, that we have a very fundamental responsibility to those of our sisters and brothers who are the worst victims of the system that we have to deal with. And um, I'd like to point out that uh, whatever honorarium uh, comes from the speaking engagement here at the university will be used towards the movement to liberate other political prisons, as is the case whenever I speak on any campus or whenever uh, donations are made. It's a long struggle, and I hope that 
when the day is over, uh, many of the sisters and brothers who are here will feel the necessity to commit themselves to that movement. Perhaps uh, we can make it a little bit more informal with questions and answers and comments. Sister. Um, like, so what you're saying, and like what I've seen like in the prisons and the system, the uh, problem we're getting at is that um, like no matter what, you know, you like you've done and you know how they, people, I think the thing that they don't see, I don't know, what you've done, what you go to jail for, because they treat everybody the same, they, everybody's fucked up, no matter, you know, what, what you've done, if you're just in there for a ticket, I for a murder because of the way the system has done it, you know, the people that run the jail, um, the, you know, no matter what you've done, they treat you, you know, you're still a prisoner, you know, they treat you still as just, because they're programmed to that thing. Well, see, so you know, one of, you know, like, I'm confused, and I'm trying to, like, you know, express what I'm trying to say and relate to what it is and what you're trying to say. Well, Sister, one of the things, I'm glad you brought that out because, you know, a lot of people were asking us and while I was in prison myself and while the movement around my freedom was being built, they were saying, well, what do you mean when you say political prisoner? You know, who are you talking about? Are you just talking about those sisters and brothers who have gotten uh, busted because they work with a, an organization and uh, the police have uh, vamped down on that organization, or are you talking about uh, more than those who are busted because of their political activities? And I think that it's very clear that the jails and prisons are filled not only with those who are there because of the fact that they have taken some active, overt step against the system, conscious step, but they're filled with sisters and brothers who are just victims of the racism that exists. And one of the um, cases that I have always uh, found to be the worst example, the example of the worst of this system, is the system of Hill. And I don't know whether you all know uh, Marie Hill, whether you've heard it's Marie Hill. She's in right now in the <coughs> women's prison in Raleigh, North Carolina. She's about 21 years old now. When she was 16, she was picked up by some racist white cops in Rocky Mount, North Carolina. And she was told that a white grocery store owner had been killed, had been uh, murdered, they said, and that they were taking her in for that. And when they got her to the jail, first of all, they didn't tell her that she had a right to counsel. The only thing they told her was that she better sign this piece of paper which said that she had committed that crime because if she didn't, they were going to kill her. <coughs> and according to her own testimony, I understand, they beat her until she was convinced that if she didn't sign that paper, they were going to kill her. So she signed the confession. The prosecutor takes the confession, presents that as the sole definitive piece of evidence against her, and a jury of 12 white racists convicts her of murder in a two-day trial. And not only that, but on the same day that they convicted her, they sentenced her to the gas chamber. And she was 17 years old at the time of the trial. As a result of some concerned sisters and brothers who heard about what had gone down in North Carolina. Uh, something of a movement was created around her case uh, a number of years ago, and eventually the death sentence was commuted just shortly before it, uh, the Supreme Court allegedly abolished the death penalty. But it was commuted to life without possibility of parole.
And so Marie Hill is still in prison with no possibility of ever being released unless the people come to her support. And see, one of the interesting things that has happened to her, and I, because I think this is a this is a, a, a classical path of development for so many um, black and Chicano and Puerto Rican Indian prison prisoners in this country today. Once she was arrested, she began to uh, reflect on her situation. Why was it that she was there? She began to talk with the other sisters. And she began to develop a political consciousness which told her that it was because of the existence of racism and nothing else. That was the only reason why she was in uh, that prison. And because of what she and some of the other sisters have done in order to educate and enlighten other women prisoners, and because of protests that they've organized, she has been a target of political repression as well within the prison apparatus. And just a couple of months ago, they brought her up on charges of um, having uh, been involved with having um, assaulted a, a prison guard. And we investigated the situation. We found out that they had walled her into a situation where they provoked her where if she hadn't defended herself, she would have uh, uh, been severely beaten. And this is what is happening. This is what is, and that is one of the reasons why you really can't say that uh, political prisoners are only those who are arrested because they are a member of this organization or because they have uh, participated in this demonstration or because they have uh, uh, been involved in this. Because in the prisons today, the intensity with which political consciousness is being imparted to the masses of prisoners uh, does not permit us to make that distinction. And the existence of racism doesn't permit us to make that distinction between so-called <laughs> political prisoners and, and, uh, and all of our sisters and brothers who are unjustly uh, incarcerated because of the existence of racism.